Hello everyone, welcome to today's section on democratizing of ML pipelines and bringing ML workflow to heterogeneous cloud native ML platforms. My name is Tommy, I'm a senior software developer at IBM Open Tech Teams, and I also have my colleague Yi Hong Wang here to help me as well. And let's go into today's section. So in the ML um, workflows, um, we can see like in the high level, we have different you know, phrases from the data phrase where you have teams that need to like go data the data, analyze data. And we have data science team, they need to do like machine learning, deep learning, and you know, create the models. And finally, we have operation team to deploy the model and maintain the model. So we can see like there's a lot of different teams working on different uh, part of the ML life cycles. But when we actually you know, break it down into automation and have if different teams are responsible for each different sections, we could see it could break down into a lot of smaller uh, sections as well, like from data preparations, cleansing, ingesting, analyzing, transforming, could, could all break down into different teams and different workflows. And when we need to connect all these kind of workflow together, we could see like there a big overhead on team need to like porting different uh, components into a different platform with different uh, technology uh, sections um, and stacks. So that's why we want to have a actually a heterogeneous pipeline that could be able to run with different kind of environments and based on different requirements, they could actually pour into uh, a same type of uh, information and data, uh, metadata that could be shared among each other. And when we actually look into how to do that on Kubernetes, there's like two popular projects that could actually do that. One is actually Argo Workflows. So Argo Workflow is a project that is able to containerize uh, workflow engines for orchestrating parallel jobs, right? Um, and able to implement you know, the whole uh, pipeline as a Kubernetes CRD. And you could see um, our Argo workflow also provide a very nice UIs and all the uh, components actually you know, wrap it into a pod, so actually have a dedicated environment. And then uh, it also could run as a DAG, so as a sub -dex. So it's actually very easy for you to like, create very complex graph when you have like, very complex uh, machine learning workflow as well. And then there's another option called Tecton Pipeline. That's where uh, IBM's and a lot of the company working on OpenShift that's using because uh, Tecton Pipeline project also provides Kubernetes style resource uh, for decorating CI/CD style pipelines. And actually able to break into uh, two different kind of runs. So you could actually have like a run that is wrapped into a pod, have a dedicated environment, but you have like common tasks where you need to like just run it in the same environment. You could also have like uh, dedicated controller to do like very fast job, let's say like parameter storing or just caching, you could use a controller to actually handle that without creating a dedicated pod environment. And why this is important to run on OpenShift, because OpenShift uh, pipeline is a project that um, you know, uh, OpenShift uh, container platform have created. And this is like the de facto CI CD capability on top of OpenShift. And it's actually uh, certified uh, by Red Hat have like uh, dedicated you know, security scans. And it also have the enterprise version av av available on OpenShift, so all enterprise users that want to run on OpenShift and have a secure environment, this is kind of like the de facto pipeline they need to run. So we can see like um, from different you know, users and different departments, they might have different you know, pipeline system they want to run their ML workflows. So now how could we kind of connect all of them together? This is when we actually look into a, a project called Kubeflow Pipelines. Uh, so Kubeflow Pipelines is actually a, um, uh, another stack that's run on top of you know, Argo workflows and Tecton workflow as a um, connected um, layers. So um, Kubeflow Pipeline actually provides you know, any ML framework that you could do. Uh, let's say you, you want to use PyTorch for model training, you want to do like prompt and you could all done on Kubeflow. And it also provides a very nice uh, you know, Python SDK and, and DSL for data scientists to craft their pipelines. As we can see, like, a lot of the uh, CI CD workflow environment, they don't really have a robust you know, uh, interface for um, crafting pipelines. So q Pipeline provides a very nice interface for Python DSLs. And the DSL actually gives you capability for in, uh, define inputs and outputs and conditions. So, you could just actually craft the pipeline just like how you do a regular you know, programming language. And, um, and I think the very um, needed feature is actually parallel loops. We, as we can see in um, machine learning workflows, a lot of the problems need to be parallelly executed under like, um, different environments. Let's say you want to train models with 
you know, different parameters. A, a looping feature is very common within uh, ML workflow platforms. And the uh, very nice optimization that Q4 pipeline provide is that you're actually not executing the pipeline itself. You're actually leveraging whatever platform you have. Let's say you have Argo, you know, host stacks as your CI CD, you could leverage that. And you, you have like, let's say enterprise uh, requirement they need to run an OpenShift pipeline. You could also leverage OpenShift pipeline to run all your actual workflows. And on top of that, it actually provides you know, good experiment and metadata tracking. So all the metadata could be shared between different platforms and also provide gar garbage cleanups as, we, uh, as um, the default workflow environment usually don't have uh, garbage cleanup and caching. And this is what Q4 pipeline aim to provide. And um, as we kind of work on, uh, you know, Q4 pipeline, especially on the tech conversions, uh, we kind of see in the early stage, we use, you create a very dedicated UI to have a version control for the pipeline and I build a display, a very nice graph for the pipelines and, you know, uh, do garbage collection, have, you know, dedicated DSL and API to reduce Kubernetes cost to the Kubernetes API. So reduce the, uh, wolf, um, the actual traffic to the uh, Kubernetes stack itself. And then because we, want, we don't want to intervene the actual uh, workflows under the backend, in, in the V1 version, we actually just cache using part mutations, which is actually uh, one of the bottleneck we will actually discuss how we mitigate that later on. And uh, another benefit is actually have experiment and run trackings where you actually provide a very good way for data science to organize their runs and able to like, um, put them into different experiments as you create different models. And they also have like um, metadata trackings where you can actually see how your input and output is being leveraged between different components. And the powerful part of you know, metadata tracking is that um, it actually gives you information on what data the model is training on and actually compare different model runs and you know, compare different metrics. And then uh, let's say you have like a caching capability because you'll carry over the state from the previous models. And then we use you know, the computer outputs so you don't have to like, uh, we do the um, training process, let's say, oh, the pre-processing process, you expect the result to be the same. And um, as we kind of discussed with the earlier approach of the Q4 pipelines, we kind of see that uh, as we just caching using part mutations, uh, we kind of see this still bottleneck on a lot of the caching still need to create a dedicated part because we don't want to intervene the actual pipeline flows. So we got to see a big bottleneck on the part creation and also on the scheduler itself because as we have like thousands of parts need to be created and even with caching, all those parts still need to be created and that kind of create a very big bottleneck on large scale um, ML workflows. So we could see like from a schedule perspective, creating a new part actually takes a lot of time. And I think the most important case is that um, with the Kubernetes limitation, right, with each gRPC call, you're kind of limited on like four megabytes of data. So if we kind of like wrap everything into one single graph, you could start seeing the bottlenecks on you know, graph traversal and validations. And this is what we actually need to mitigate as well to break it down the graph into multiple smaller ones on Kubernetes. So it can actually scale to like thousands or tens of thousands of tasks as we can see um, with the modern AI and ML workflow, it can actually grow to that scale. And now we're going to pass to Yi Hong to talk about what we actually uh, improved in the new version of Q4 pipelines. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. So uh, I'm in here, we just have a, a high-level design uh, for you to reference. That this is for the Q4 uh, pipeline V1 design. So like uh, Tommy mentioned earlier, actually we run the, the Argo implementation and tech time implementation is kind of two separate uh, silo projects, but um, that's for the V1. So if you are familiar with the Kubeflow pipeline, it has been out there for uh, several years and a lot of people adapt it and use it. But meanwhile, uh, I mean, the concept of the ML workflow and ML ops and the, even the best practice for the ML workflow uh, kept evolving. So it's actually unsurprisingly that Kubeflow pipeline actually was at a pivot point where um, in order to fulfill those new features that are coming in that, and also uh, have a better integration uh, with those um, internal components altogether, actually having a better design and a uh, big change um, were inevitable. So actually um, about one or two years ago, probably 
um, the Kupfer Pipeline team, uh, kudos to the um, Google team, they start uh, to work on a new design and then also um, review the design at the community meetings regularly and then uh, work on the implementation uh, in both um, Argo and also Tecton. Um, there are many work on the Argo side and me and Tommy, um, we are many work on the Tecton side. And finally, we got the, the new uh, release version early, I think one or two months ago. So actually, I encourage you to actually try it on and we would we, like to get some big feedback from you. And at the same time, we will also keep working on it and make it more complete and stable. So the reason I bring up the, the view and design here is that you can see, like Tommy mentioned, we start with the, um, the KP, we provide the DSL, so you can use the Python to compose your, uh, your ML pipeline flow and use the SDK uh, to actually to compile and compile the Python program and you will get the pi uh, pipeline uh, specifications. And at that moment, actually, for the V1, when you are using Argo, it actually gives you the, um, the workflow uh, custom resource, which will run on Argo, definitely. So, and if you are using a Tecton, it gives you the, the pipeline run custom uh, um, object. So, it's, it's totally different. So, when we try to, um, during the design phase for the V2, we actually <laughs> gather all those um, lessons learned and the, the requirement uh, from the V1, we, um, and there are a lot of new features and requirements. So I try to categorize them into actually two uh, main goals actually we want to achieve in the V2. The first one is because you can see here, we are using the pipeline. The pipeline spec we are using is actually different from each runtime. So we want, want to consolidate the, the pipeline spec into a, a uniform um, language that uh, is not is detached from the underlying runtime. And also the metadata that Tommy mentioned earlier, um, the, the, the data we store in the metadata store and also the way we use it is not ideal. Um, so we actually want to improve it and to make it more efficient in, in, in the whole system. And the second one is that we also want, to, you can see that we actually very, very, very tied to the underlying um, runtime engine to run those pipelines. So, we want to actually decouple the, some of the ML execution flow from the underlying runtime engine. We then, in that case, we can get more control. And then the ultimate goal is that you can actually easy, easily bring the Kubeflow pipeline actually to other runtime engine if you want. So that's the ultimate goal. So actually, instead of a 10,000 feet uh, perspective, so I, I would try to dive into the detail of the new design um, in this session. So let, let's start with the, the first one, the pipeline spec. So in the V1, like I mentioned, the, the pipeline spec is directly uh, tied to the under, underlying runtime engine. So um, even in the UI, you also need to understand two different languages. One is from Argo, one is from the Tecton. And because that pipeline artifact is directly run on Argo and Tecton, we also need to build in a lot of uh, backend logic in, in, into the pipeline. So in a V2, we try to introduce uh, um, another spec we call the intermediate representation. We call it IR. So we define the IR as actually the, 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 the pipeline spec. So it's actually easier for you to understand because uh, it's also in the YAML format, but it's easier to understand because when you compose a pipeline, uh, like Tom mentioned, you will try to compose the DAG uh, in your pipeline. So we are using a more intuitive um, uh, syntax to help you to compose um, the, the IR. And it's also a platform agnostic because we will use this IR in every uh, runtime that we support. And it's also exchangeable because I will talk about it later. And the bonus part is the UI because right now UI don't have to understand Argo. You don't have to understand the telecom. The only language you need to know is the IR. And based on the IR, um, if you are using it, um, we, we try to promote it as kind of the open standard to define an ML workflow and even um, the small task. So if you share this kind of uh, IR, you can actually share it uh, to the whole community. And even, even you can uh, form maybe a central repository to store those um, IR. And it's actually open up the 
possibility that actually you can actually build an ML component ecosystem from the campaign user, even from the vendor. So they can all use this IR to um, share the component or maybe the piece of the pipeline um, into this kind of cent um, central repository, just like um, you have the, we store all the image on the Docker Hub, right, or the Quail IO. So if you use the IR to share the component and also someone build a central repository to store it, it will be perfect. So people will, in the ML world, we can easily exchange those um, IR with each other. And furthermore, I think um, inside, based on this assumption, actually, um, inside the KPS DK, we also provide a registered client that you can actually talk to this kind of compatible component registry. So you can actually pull the component or the pipeline uh, on the fly when you are composing your, um, your ML flow. And actually, the ultimate goal is that we try to promote um, the local and no-code approach to compose ML pipeline. So you can imagine that if there is a platform that can support the component registry, so you can actually automatically pull down those components from the component registry and show up, um, for, for example, on your right-hand side. So you can just easily drag and drop those components and, and link those pieces together and compose your ML workflow. It will be perfect and easy, right? So that's the ultimate goal, and so, so that's why we introduced the IR. And the next step is that since we introduced the IR, so you can see it's that the design is a little bit different, so we, but it starts from here, right? Originally, we, we, we have the, um, the artifact that comes from the Argo or Tecton. Right now, we replace it with the IR, and then you submit the IR um, to the pipeline service. But one thing that we need also need to introduce is another component we call the backend compiler because ultimately those pipelines still need to be executed on the Argo or Tecton, right? So although we define the IR um, as the uh, pipeline spec, so inside the pipeline service we introduce another component we call the backend compiler, which you can think is like an interpreter that he can interpret the IR and into um, the runtime engine that wh which you are using right now. For example, if you are using Argo, it will, like, like I said, you will, uh, you will transform it to uh, the workflow. If you are using the Tecton, it will tra transform it to the pipeline run. So you can, with, with this kind of design, you can easily actu actually swap out the underlying runtime engine. But wait for it, we still need to have another extra component here um, to actually fulfill the whole life cycle. Uh, it's called the abstract layer. So you are thinking that pipeline service actually right now need to talk to different engine right now. So we are trying to uh, come up with a plugin mechanism that actually help the pipeline service to actually talk to the whole underlying different engines. So we create an abstract interface that uh, when, when you have the backend compiler and then you submit an IR and when it generate uh, the, the underlying artifact that really need to perform on your runtime engine, it will actually go using this um, interface. So for the pipeline service, you, you, you won't touch directly to, for example, the Argo controller. You won't touch, touch directly to the Tecton, Tecton uh, controller. You will talk to this unified uh, interface. So like I mentioned, I think here we want to promote this kind of mechanism is that um, if you have your own runtime, you are easily you can easily just implement this interface and plug in your runtime into the the Kubeflow pipeline system. And now he can support your own uh, runtime to run um, the the pipeline. So that's enough for the the IR. So uh, if you remember, the second topic we want to tackle is that ML metadata. I think in the V1, um, this you can see the the design for the V1. Um, we, we have a component called MLMD Writer. It's actually running as a, a synchronous Python program and it's uh, actively monitored um, the Kubernetes part that is created when you run in the, uh, when you run in the pipeline. So you can see it's actually and kind of running in a, a, a synchronous fashion, right? So it's, it, 
its only way is keep waiting for when that task is finished, the part is finished, so it grab those data, input data and output data and store into the metadata. That's not efficient. And in this way, it's actually hard to actually integrate, um, to, to reuse the metadata information inside uh, each step of your pipeline. So in the V2, we try to actually embed the MLMD um, into the uh, pipeline execution. As you can see here, all the component is meaning that it's a, a subset of your pipeline. So it's actually directly talked to the MLMD, so we remove the MLMD uh, right here. So in this way, actually, the MLMD will be provide extra benefit for the, the whole pipeline. For example, you can actually use the MLMD to support caching because all the tasks, uh, output, input, and output are stored in the MLMD immediately after the task finished. So if you have another task actually depends on uh, that uh, finished task, you can actually immediately talk to the MD and grab those data. And the other thing is that you can support caching because when you spin up another pipeline run and the pipeline is actually ask you the same component with the same, exactly the same parameters, you actually don't need to run that component again. You can just grab those results from the metadata and then show, show it to the user. And the, the other benefit is that in the UI right now, when we show the, the real-time pipeline run status, we can also get those status from MLMD directly. Yeah. So furthermore, I think when, um, when you look at the, the component here, I, right now I will dive into a little bit for how the components are run and how the components are leveraging the MLMD. Because earlier um, in the V1, when we run these component, this big component, we actually directly rely on the underlying engine. We just put that task to um, the Argo Twitter task for the tech time and you will run it for us. Because the MLMD is run asynchronously and collect the uh, part information separately. But in here, we try to promote uh, the task directly uh, push the input and also the output to MLMD. So we introduce another uh, uh, mechanism we call smart runtime is actually a driver, executor, and publish wrapper. So, in this kind of fashion, actually driver will, when, when the text start, it will actually start with the driver. So driver will help to do some uh, the preparation steps. For example, um, if there is any um, parameter that you want to get from the upstream task, you can actually talk to the MLMD and get those value and substitute those value as the real value and put it. Um, the, there for the uh, executors. And when the executor finish, executor you, you can think just like a wrapper, wrap around user's task. So it will actually run the user's task. And by the end of the user task, it will also publish all the results into the MLMD immediately. So that, in, in this kind of mechanism, like I mentioned, if you have any uh, downstream task, which is, depends on your upstream, you can immediately uh, pull in those data from MLMD, yeah. So I think those are the, the mechanism and new implementation we bring into the V2. And I think the goal is actually making the V2 um, could be actually porting into, uh, to support different kind of uh, runtime engines. So I think here I will just hand back to Tommy. He, talk, he will cover about some of the performance improvements we, we, we did in the V2. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So as you have learned um, from Ihong, so Ihong have demonstrated a new way to you know, implement Q4 pipelines, where um, now uh, all the Q4 pipeline components actually represent an intermediate representation. So in the actual Kubernetes um, layers, you don't, you don't have to like, store all the pipeline into one single uh, custom resource definition. So we can actually break down pipeline into smaller pieces. But I think one of the downfall of this is that uh, as we kind of implement this whole, all the features and have feature complete, able to pull different pipeline between different backends um, from different users, uh, we see that uh, we introduced the driver, publisher, and executor components. Uh, and because of those components, we have now introduced a new um, smaller layers of like um, code need to be executed. And what the optimization we have done in the beginning is that from a tech time side, we actually introduced custom task controller where all these common tasks, just publishing and retrieving information could be done in a common controller so we don't have to create extra part for that. 
in the algal world, um, the committee is working on the HPV template to replicate the same approach. And um, the result is pretty promising. And we could see like um, the run time could be reduced significantly, which I will show later on. And uh, the second phrase we want to improve is that uh, as we introduce this new driver and publisher task, um, the graph complexity actually gets very bad um, uh, when you scale up. As we can see, each graph, uh, when you connect the driver layers um, uh, down to the, um, all, all the uh, tasks you need to run, you actually need to connect all the roof nodes. And for the publisher, you know, need to connect all the leaf nodes to actually publish all the information once the you know, sub-graph is finished. So this actually introduces a big graph complexity, and we need to improve that. Um, and um, so I think the first phrase we have done in the current uh, state is that um, we kind of combine, at least from the uh, contain from the task level, publisher and, um, and drivers, we merge them into one, and also give the capabilities of um, the task able to run anything that's um, not the part as well. Because the original design, we expect all the user tasks to be just a um, part wrapped the containers. And as we can see, in real world scenario, you actually have like different training platforms and pre-processing platforms that leverage Kubernetes resource. For example, you might want to use Spark jobs for uh, pre-processing. You, you just want to create a, a, a Spark component. And you don't want to just run your components uh, in a Part, right? You just, just don't want to run a client. You just want to run a CRD um, in your Kubernetes platform. And we're able to provide that capabilities in these new designs where um, the user component doesn't have to be a container. It could just be a custom resource as well. And um, some of the, uh, so I just kind of like high level uh, recap on what Q4 Pipeline V2 brings. Uh, with this new design, the caching is actually handled by the new driver code, so we don't have to do like part mutations. That significantly reduces the amount of um, part that we need to schedule and we need to create on the Kubernetes clusters. And all the code will be uploaded, all the uh, parameter and artifact are actually uploaded by the driver and publisher itself. So we actually have to bypass some of the um, workflow, like, uh, workflow engine level limitation, as we can see, um, from a performance side, at least from Tectons. Tectons have a, a limitation on parameter passing because um, even in Argo as well, uh, parameter passing is very difficult on the workflow level because they need to watch the con uh, con uh, user container to be finished and then publish those uh, information back to um, the uh, workflow itself. Right? So usually they need to run a sidecar or have to run some process right after the uh, user component is finished, so that's why that creates this kind of limitation. And with the Q4 pipeline new design, we actually create our own binary to push all our information to our dedicated metadata server. So uh, no matter what platform you use, those metadata will be shared, and the, the workflow engine itself doesn't have to handle like, a big chunk of data. And finally, um, because we need to uh, integrate and also merge all the information, because right now we're actually breaking a lot of pipelines into smaller pipelines on Kubernetes, all those uh, suddenly need to be aggregated together. And uh, this is also what the new design is um, going to bring, where when your subcomponent is finished, those information will be pushed to uh, Q4 Pipeline, and Q4 Pipeline able to aggregate a very nice graph for you. And behind the scenes, all those um, smaller graphs actually uh, executed individually on Kubernetes. So you actually reduce the limitation on the Kubernetes um, custom resource definition limit uh, on itself. And with this, I'm going to just uh, demo what it looks like with the new design and how you actually see um, Give for Pattern bring a very nice UI and how it could actually you know, pass different metadata across different backends. So um, in the Kit for Pipeline UI, you could actually see this multiple pipeline you could create. And on the pipeline you create, we actually have added credibility you could actually create different versions. For example, in this case, um, by default, I have um, Kit for Pipeline will have all the components enabled with caching. But let's say you, you don't want to have caching for the training, you could actually easily, uh, I, I just picked the version where I make uh, training without cache. Uh, you could actually enable that uh, in the SDK as well. So once the compiler, once the compiler finished the uh, compilation into IR, you could actually see, actually the cursor is a bit, 
awkward. Problematic. Give me one second. You could see, like, uh, for example, so with preprocessing, you want to always enable like true because preprocessing, you're always processing the data into the same result, so it makes sense to always have it true. But uh, as we can see for the training, um, things should have uh, a false over here. The Sorry, the cursor is a little bit uh, problematic. Okay. This one, to make sure I'm in the right version. Can, can you do search? I think on the training side, um, I think the caching should be um, set to false. So uh, that way, <laughs> Um, when you actually um, do the training part, um, the training itself is actually uh, always been as secure, and you want to make sure the algorithm itself using the same data always uh, converge to the same result. So sometimes you might want to have uh, the training set to false. Um, as we can see, like once you have the uh, caching enables, um, um, when you have all the cache, uh, all, all the components being cached, uh, all those components you could see could be executed in less than one second. So um, with all this information, um, if you have everything cached, you only have like two second bottleneck on uh, traversing the whole graph and able to pass all the information of, and, and metadata information displayed over here. Um, and I could kind of show you um, examples just to run. I think, um, I think this one might, might, might upload it by mistakes, but um, let's see. It will kind of run this component, uh, this pipelines uh, over here. Uh, for the component that is being cached, you could see the um, uh, cache component would be uh, computed immediately and give you this um, results because the results are stored in a centralized uh, uh, ML metadata <laughs> service. And then um, the training steps where you always want to train, so it would just take the cache the components into the training process. As you could see from the log, it would just start the training and. Uh, from a data science perspective, you want to always make sure your models converge to the same results using the same data. So, it, uh, so in this case, it makes sense to actually always train and produce a new model to make sure all the models, uh, when they use the same data, are able to converge to the same results. And um, all this metadata are able to share with different uh, backends. So as you can see, um, this actually able to improve the performance significantly. Um, for example, you just want everything without caching uh, with the pipeline. You actually take about 30 seconds for this. But if you're able to like, um, at least cache the preprocessing part, you're able to reduce uh, at least the performance by um, one third of it. And if you have more information you need to cache, you can actually uh, significantly improve your overall pipeline uh, t runtime uh, as well. And um, that kind of concludes the uh, demo itself. I was will, I going to uh, go over what will be uh, happening next with the Q4 pipeline projects. As we can see, um, we have you know done a lot of improvement in terms of caching, breaking down the um, graph itself, and able to scale out uh, significantly. But we could still see like uh, the extra um, abstract, uh, abstract that we introduced from the driver and publisher logic itself, uh, kind of makes the uh, graph traversal a little bit uh, more complicated. So in the next phase, we want to actually embed all those driver and publisher logic into as part of the controller, and we are working with different backend uh, workflow community to actually um, make this as pluggable. So this way, we were able to reduce the um, graph complexity um, from the new design as well, but also have all the nice feature of uploading and downloading all the information and aggregate all the uh, uh, status into a centralized um, metadata service where it could share between different backends. And the beauty of like, having a centralized metadata service is that not only uh, the current phrase Argo and Tecton could use it, but also when you introduce a new, let's say, workflow, let's say uh, MLflow or 
let's say a Ray workflow we want to introduce, that's not run on Kubernetes, you could easily leverage the new abstracted layer from Q4 pipeline, introduce a new backend, and share the same metadata service um, between different teams. So this is kind of like the um, angle we want to aim for Q4 pipelines. And if you want to learn more about the project, uh, here are the links to the core um, Tecton project itself. Uh, we have the Q4 um, pipelines on top of Tectons, and also if you want to join the community uh, meeting, you could come uh, chat on the uh, Q4 stack. And, um, and also at the end, uh, our uh, IBM Watson X products also run on um, Q4 pipeline to leverage uh, the orchestration on all the um, workflow components. So you can also check out what's an actually you're interested in you know, using large language model and also create a new workflows uh, for your own model as well. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? I think we run over. Okay, sure. Uh, I think we run out of time, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.